park, and I was doing some peripheral research. And at the end of the day, I went to a lodge off the park's entrance. And uh, late that night, not late, 7.30 or 8 o'clock, I get that knock on the door. And there's two people standing there, and they say, hey, we're from the park service. And I think, okay, here it comes. They're going to really try to fry me. I said, no, we know who you are. We know your research. We've actually read your book, books, and we want to talk to you. I said, okay, come on in. And they lay out this story of people that have disappeared at parks they've worked at in their career. And both these individuals had been around 15, 20 years, and they worked at three or four different parks. Now, listen carefully to what they say. They say that, yeah, they think that there's an abnormal amount of people that disappear at their parks. And on the front end, there's a lot of publicity. And on the back end, there's no publicity. And there's no follow-up. And it's almost as though nobody cares. And they said, we can't actually state that something weird is going on, but we think it's unusual, and we're surprised that the Park Service isn't doing something about it. And we think you should really look into it because we think there's a big story here. And so we talked about it more, and they named a couple of locations. The next morning when I drove out, I called a couple of law enforcement guys I know, and I I laid it out for them, and I said, hey, just do some peripheral research and try to figure out if there's big numbers missing from these locations. And son of a gun, they called me for an hour, and they said, hey, there's something big, big, big here. And the biggest thing right away that we found out is that if you go to the website of any municipal law enforcement agency in the western U.S. that's moderate in size, we're not talking huge, just moderate in size, on that law enforcement website, there's going to be a section about missing people. The National Park Service has a contingent of federally trained law enforcement officers. These aren't guys and ladies that go pick up garbage at the campsite. These are federally trained, better trained than most of the guys that work in the cities around here, federal law enforcement officers, and then they have another category called special agents that do all the follow-up on their work. Those are like the detectives. So right away, we couldn't find any information about missing people inside the Park Service. Kind of odd. And uh, when I got back, I made some inquiries, filed the Freedom of Information Act request, probably over 50 of them by now, and things only got more murky. And as we started to work on this, we started to figure out that there were clusters of disappearances in North America. Even more weird. And the way we found this out is we filed the Freedom of Information Act against the Park Service asking them for a list of the missing people inside their system. Now, I could teach anybody in this room how to keep track of missing people in 15 minutes or less with a clipboard and a binder paper. The date they disappeared, their name, the location. That's it. You don't need some massive computer system. You don't need some interlink system. There is your tracking device for the park. Park Service comes back and says... We don't have any list of missing people from any of our parks or anywhere in our system. So initially, three of us in a room looked at each other and said, this has got to be some kind of semantical error on our part. We just wrote this wrong. So we had another researcher write it in a different way. And about three weeks later, we get a response back, no, we understood your first request. We don't have any list of missing people. So I called the head of the Freedom of Information Act for the Park Service in Denver. Very nice lady. Charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, Wilson. Very nice. Very helpful. She goes, Dave, it's embarrassing to say we don't have any lists, according to the parks. I said, none? None. I said, okay, now I'm going to start pulling some strings here. I've written two books, published two books from a fairly big-name publisher. So according to the Freedom of Information Act, I can get what's called a publisher's and author's exemption to any costs incurred when I make a request under FOIA. So I requested that, and I asked for a list of all missing people inside their system and all missing people from Yosemite National Park. 
Six weeks later, I get a call from an attorney in the Park Service. I know something weird is going on. Mr. Politis, uh, we got your request, and it's gonna, we're going to charge you. We're not going to respond or, or authorize the author's exemption. I said, why not? Well, we looked, and we have uh, determined that your books aren't in enough public libraries to qualify. I said, can you point to where that is in the FOIA? We're not going to address that. It's nowhere in FOIA. It, there, that is not one of the criteria. It says published author. So he says, but we can come up with that list from all of our parks. And we can come up with that list from Yosemite for you. From Yosemite, that list is going to cost you $34,000. And the list from our parks is going to cost you $1.4 million. This isn't a joke. So I put him on the speakerphone and I said, say that again. Some of the guys, all law enforcement guys are sitting in the room. After we got off the phone, we said, we were even more determined than ever because we knew something is really, really wrong. And so we there started the next three years of us camping out wherever we could to find archived information in, on missing people. And we just honed in, first of all, on Yosemite because it was in our backyard. And that is the cluster of the largest mass of disappearances in the wilds of North America anywhere. And, folks, I'm not talking about mountain climbers who disappeared on the side of El Capitan, people who fell into rivers, um, people who were suicidal. All of those were eliminated. We're looking for a specific type of disappearance which can't be answered. We're talking about the true whodunits. Nothing like this has ever been done before. So... Uh, talk about the Rangers, initially lots of publicity, then none. No tracking mechanism for all the distant people. And the, the attitude of their own national park system wasn't correct. Also, another thing, people that disappear inside national parks, 80% of the time you'll never find them on a, dis, on a database, excuse me, anywhere in North America as a missing person. Why? That's not right. So, after you look at thousands of cases of missing people, certain criteria kind of start falling out, and we started to recognize them. And it took a lot of cases. First of all, start with, it's a rural location. Dogs were involved in a lot of the disappearances, meaning the people disappeared with a dog, the dog disappeared with the person. Dogs were involved one way or another. Strange one, and I'll talk about this. This year, I was invited to give a presentation just like this in front of the National Association of Search and Rescue Professionals at Harvey's Lake Tahoe this last summer. 3,000 people from all across North America. Two of their administrators read my books, and they said, Dave, you've got to talk. And I'm telling you, I hit, a, I hit a bone with them. These people have canines that track. Sometimes they're concerned when they don't want to track. And when I say one of the criteria of this study is that the canines decide, uh-uh, we're not tracking. Um, sometimes they walk in a tight circle and lay down. Handlers came up to me afterwards and go, oh, my God, I thought it was just my dog. But I, I couldn't understand why they were acting like that. There was supposed to be a good scent, and they didn't want anything to do with it. That's part of it. Um, an abnormal amount of the people that disappear have a disability, some kind of disability or mental impairment. Um, when, they're, when that normal person's found, an abnormal amount have a fever. And it's very rare when we can find a reporter that went into that detail but some of them did and actually interviewed a physician at the hospital. And the physician said, yeah, they have some, some, something wrong. They have a fever. Um, the, the victim is found in a conscious or semi, unconscious or semi-state 
highly unusual, but it, it happens with this study. The people disappear in the afternoon or early evenings. Swamps and briar patches are commonly associated along with berries. When the victim is found, clothing is removed, removed or shoes are removed. Missing found in an area previously searched. This is a huge one. You interview search and rescue people and they say, we searched that area 30 times. We were in that surrounding area all day and night for three weeks and then all of a sudden they showed up there. How? We have no idea. The victim can't or won't remember what happened. This diagram on the right, committed to memory, those boys have never been found, and they disappeared in the wilds of North America. Top left, Douglas Legg from New York, 1971, was with his family, super wealthy family of the Hamley near the Adirondacks in New York, on a family vacation, disappeared. They brought in the Green Berets to search for him. They tracked him supposedly over 50 miles around the outskirts of Lake Placid, New York, and back down the other side through the roughest part of the high mountain peaks in New York. Never found him. Canines tracked him there. The searchers were on it, and they said, we can't believe this kid went there. We can't believe it, but the dogs are on it. Uh, Dennis Johnson, 66, from Yellowstone Park. One of the strangest disappearances I've ever researched. It's in the book. He was with his family. He and his sister disappeared simultaneously. His sister reappears. They go out and they search for, for the dentist for weeks. For some reason, they couldn't find any tracks. Never found. Dennis Martin, seven years old, Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Never, ever found. No tracks or nothing. One of the most recent ones is Sammy Belke, middle left, Crater Lake National Park was with his dad. Sammy had a disability, a mental disability. Derek Engbertson, Crater Lake National Park. Uh, Edward Nye, Crater Lake. Those three boys in the middle, all Crater Lake. What's unusual about that? You look at their ages and you look at their sexes, and there is something about the clusters that we identify in the books. Some clusters are old people. Some clusters are young boys. Some are girls. There's a consistent element in each one of those clusters that's highly, highly suspect. Bottom left, Dickie Sudin, mid-Sierras in Northern California. James Bordenkircher, mid-Sierras. He disappeared from North Lake Tahoe, from his parents' kind of a rural location right on the Nevada border, still missing. And Travis Zweig, Southern California, Pinion Pines, disappeared. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you, that I want everybody in this room to take that paradigm you have about missing people and throw it in the garbage can right now. These boys right here, how many people in this room have kids? First of all, raise your hand so I have an idea how many parents. If you have a son or a daughter and they've lived through that five, six, seven-year-old age bracket, you know how far that kid can go, how far they're going to walk. And the stories about some of these kids that disappear is too phenomenal to believe. When you talk to search and rescue people, there isn't one I've ever met that said that they shouldn't be able to find a six-year-old boy that disappears in the wild. Now, animal attack has been eliminated from this. If there's an attack on a child by an animal, there's going to be a scene. There's going to be blood. There's going to be hair. It's going to be obvious, and the canines will hit on it. That's not what happened here. In, these, in this diagram right here, the boys were 2 to 14. Three boys were 8 years old. This is about women who disappeared now. Teresa Breyer, Shut Eye Peak, uh, kind of up above Fresno in the Sierras. Stacy Aris. That one right there, I will never give up on this case. I lived in Los Gatos, California, for about 20 years, Northern California, right outside of uh, San Jose. Stacy lived in Saratoga. And right when we started on this, that was one of the first cases that I got hit with. It was in 81. She was with her dad, and they were in the high Sierras of Yosemite, riding horses into a backcountry area with six other people. 
they ride up to these cabins that are in the middle of nowhere, and they had rented them with the backpacker and the horse, horseman. They get off their horses. Stacy and her dad go into one of the cabins that they're sharing, and she comes out with her dad, and she says, hey, dad, she's got her camera. She goes, I'm going to go over to this point right here. I'm going to take some pictures, and I'm going to go with this other man, a 71-year-old man who was on horseback. She and the 71-year-old man walk 20, 30 yards out to this point, and they sit down on a boulder. She's taking pictures with him. Everyone can see him. They're not very far away. In this portion of Yosemite, there's a lot of boulders of granite, a lot of just straight granite. She tells this man, she goes, I'm going to walk down to that lake right there and take some pictures of the lake 200 yards away. Okay. So her dad and everybody sees Stacy walk by herself down to the lakes. It was the last time Stacy was ever seen. I talked to her uncle, who was part of the search team, and, she's, and they said, Dave, we searched for a month. Only one thing we ever found, and that is right at the entrance to the lake area, when they were walking in amongst the trees, they found the lens cap to her camera sitting on the, or laying on the uh, trail. Last thing they ever found. Now, what's important about this case is that I've made them a Freedom of Information Act request for the Park Service for this case file. Every other case file from the Park Service where I name the person and the location and the date, if I spoon feed it to them, if I lead them to it, I'll get it. I lead them to this case and they say, no, you can't have it. So what? I've never had that happen. And they said, no, we're not going to release that case. I said, give me an explanation. No, we're not going to give you one. A week later, I get a, uh, a call at home from the special agent in Yosemite that has this case. His last name was Yu, Y-U. I'll never forget it. Yu says, uh, Mr. Politis, why do you want this case? Violation of federal law and the Freedom of Information Act. The government entity that you're filing the Freedom of Information Act against cannot use your reason as a rationale to give you the case or deny the case. It's irrelevant to them. I said, hey, Special Agent you, I'm, I'm going to be polite. I'm an ex-law enforcement guy, but that's an inappropriate question. You can't ask it. I can ask anything I want. Okay. So I want this because I, I, I'm writing a book. We're keeping track of missing people. I want to understand the circumstances of how Stacy disappeared. He says, well, she disappeared. What else do you want to know? I said, is this a missing person's case or is this a criminal investigation? Two, dif two different types of cases in the law enforcement world. If there's a crime involved, it's a criminal investigation. Missing people is not a crime. Now, if there's a suspect in the disappearance then it's kidnapping or abduction. Now it's criminal again. So I ask him that. He says, no, straight missing persons case. Okay, are there any suspects? No. Has anyone touched the file in the last 15 years? Not that I can tell. I said, then what's the reason you're denying me access? Yep, we just made a decision that on this one you're not going to get it. Okay, so I appealed through my congressman, and I, den I got denied again. So I went to her uncle, and I said, hey, why would they be denying me this? And he says, well, have you gotten other cases? I said, I have a stack in my room that's 10 feet tall. And he says, I have no idea, Dave. And to this day, I have never seen that case file. I wrote about it. I wrote about the elements I just told you. And we accumulated probably 20 different articles so we could kind of piece the story together. What happened to Stacey Harris? I don't know. But it's troublesome when a federal agency says they have to give you information and they won't. If I had the money, I'd probably take them to federal court and sue them for access. We don't have that kind of money. Uh, Lynn Olson in the middle left uh, I write about her. She disappeared from Wyoming. She was staying at her parents' or her grandparents' dude ranch. She went down to a lake to take a summer swim, disappeared. They found a pile of her clothes under a tree, never found her again. She wasn't in the lake. Marjorie West was picking wildflowers, disappeared uh, in Pennsylvania. 
Anna Waters disappeared from Half Moon Bay, California. Very strange disappearance. Thelma Melton, Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Gloria McDonald disappeared from a state park in Arkansas. And Ruth Jacobs disappeared from Amador County in California. And those are, those are nine of the biggest whodunits you'll ever see. But there's 400 of those cases that we write about in both books. People should never disappear and not be found. Grab that thought. If somebody disappears in the wilds up there in the hills, they should always be found. Because once somebody dies, after about one week, your body starts to gas up. It gives out specific odors. And canines can actually pick out a body that's decomposing under the water and are giving out minute amounts of bubbles. They can pick out the body on top of the water. So to not find a body after weeks, let alone days, it's very strange. Most disturbing of everything we found is that in Pennsylvania, 29 children, 10 years or younger, went missing there from 1880 to 1957. In 1941 alone, three children vanished five months apart and were never found. There is no state in the United States where there are so many children missing and never found. Ever. Anywhere. There are actually clusters. We, we made the entire state of Pennsylvania a cluster. There are actually clusters inside the state where these kids have disappeared. I've had hundreds of emails about this since people read the books. Different hypotheses and things. Nothing really concrete. Nothing solid. But it is very, very strange. Again, the, the continuity in these disappearances, the commonalities that occur are mind-boggling. It's almost as though you're reading the same report time after time after time where the elements of these people have vanished. So, when we finished the study initially and the two books were written, there were 30 clusters of disappearances in North America. Now we've identified four more. Three or more missing from each cluster minimum. Maximum, there's probably over 30 in Yosemite and a few other locations. The top locations, Yosemite, Crater Lake, Mount Rainier, Sequoia Kings Canyon, Great Smoky Mountain, Glacier, and Rocky Mountain National Park. This is the map and this is a map we keep updated of the disappearances. This is just outside of Los Angeles. Some of the huge mountains that are around the L.A. Basin. Surprisingly, a lot of kids and young adults have vanished permanently and never been found that fit the criteria. This is Yosemite. Starting right here, this is the area around Mount Shasta. And then you can almost draw a straight line up through the Cascades. And now that map would have three or four more dots in Oregon and Washington where there have been uh, disappearances and, and a clusters identified. Then you curve around the, the north into Idaho, Montana, down through Wyoming, Colorado, unbelievably down in Arizona. On the far right, the big cluster on the bottom right is uh, Great Smoky Mountain National Park. And then up through the panhandle of the northeastern United States, you talk about disappearances. I mean, probably now we, we would add another 20 or 30 in the last 18 months that, that aren't even on this map. But if anybody follows the Appalachian Trail, something about the Appalachian Trail and disappearances of people, and I can't put my hand on it, I don't know why, but the Appalachian Trail walks right through the heart of, of many of those East Coast clusters. A strange circumstance. Talk about one case that kind of epitomizes what we found in a majority of these cases. 
a boy named Keith Parkins, two years old, from Ritter, Oregon. And Ritter is sort of on the eastern edge of Oregon. He and his family went to go visit their grandparents' ranch. And there are booklets that are written for search and rescue teams to follow. And it's kind of a guideline on how you set your grids, how far out you look, how you allocate resources. So 95% of all children three years, year, three years old or younger are found in two miles or less from the point they're last seen. An important statistic when you're out searching for those kids. So an article, April 11, 1952, says a little boy ran and stumbled over 12 miles in 19 hours, was found unconscious this morning, and is expected to recover. His mother said the boy has apparently forgotten his night of horror. His pants, she said, were torn to shreds, and were torn to shreds, and he climbed through fences and brush in the mountains. That's a direct quote from the article. Okay. Three years old. Okay, I, I have two kids. I, know, I remember what they were like when they were three years old. Could they run or stumble or walk or crawl 12 miles through the mountains in 19 hours? I want to find the kid that does that. I don't believe it's possible. How he got over fences and through creeks and rivers? How do you do that? So Keith crossed two different mountain ranges, several barbed wire fences, creeks, and was found in a dry creek bed. Another important statistic in these studies is that people are found in or near creek beds. But when we wrote this, this up, four of us were sitting in a room, and it's like we had an epiphany all at the same time. My question to you is what were searchers doing 12 miles from the location 19 hours after the event? Doesn't make any sense. No sense. It makes no sense. There's no way any searcher in the world would do that. One of the most concerning disappearances occurred in my backyard, Rocky Mountain National Park. Anybody here ever been there? All right, good. So he's with his family, and he's pretty deep in the mountains. They're walking up 30 feet from a river. Mom, Dad, Alfred. And uh, that's his picture down there in the lower right. And uh, all of a sudden, parents turn around. This is how quick it happens, too. There one minute, gone the next minute. They say he was gone. Park Service, I can understand it. They immediately thought he fell in the river. So they got permission from Fish and Game to shut down the river, block it, and they searched it for five days. This is the actual picture of what they were searching and when they were searching. They looked under every boulder. They looked under every rock. They put a fence line and barbed wire fence at the bottom so they wouldn't miss him when he flew by, supposedly. They never found him. But they brought in some new bloodhounds, and they tracked the boy 500 feet uphill from where the parents were. But he disappeared behind them. So the parents, right from the beginning, told the park service that he didn't fall in the water, and they felt that an abduction had occurred. They never clarified why the abduction, but they said he was abducted. There's no way our boy's going to leave us like that. So more bloodhounds were brought to the scene, and all of them walked 500 feet up the trail, and there's a fork in the trail, and they laid down. Not normal behavior. But all of them did exactly that. So as all this is going on, there's a husband and a wife backpacking way, way up in the woods. They don't know anything's going on. And as they're walking down... They're resting, and they think they hear something up above them. So the husband gets out the binoculars and looks up at this rocky crag, horrific location, way up. He sees a little boy sitting on a ledge of a rock, like 300 feet above him. He hands the binoculars. The wife goes, I, I can't believe I'm looking at this. Look at this. And she goes, oh, my God. I said, well, what crazy parents would allow their kid to do that? And then all of a sudden, the kids jerk back. <coughs> so again, they don't know anything happened. They walk down into the park, 
and they just see a lot of cars, and they saw everything, and they hear a boy's disappeared, but they don't really know much. And they drive home into Denver the next day. Alfred's picture's on the front page of the Denver Post. And both of them look at each other and say, oh, my God, that's the boy we saw. They drive back up into the park. They meet with rangers, and they tell the rangers that where they saw Alfred, and the location is called Devil's Nest. One thing I write about in the books is locations in the woods are named for certain reasons. Say uh, it's Miller's Creek. Well, maybe old family, old man Miller lived on the creek in the 1800s and he named it. The word devil comes up more than it doesn't in high altitude disappearances. And it's something that I want you to keep in the back of your mind when you're reading the books. That word devil, why did that location get that word devil? Well, initially the Park Service doesn't believe either one of them. And they separate them and they interview them independently because they didn't believe them. They both tell the same story. We saw a little boy up on that ledge. They said there's no way a boy could get up there. If we get up there, we're going to have to use carabiners and ropes and it'll take us a day and a half, two days. Make a long story short, the Park Service puts 30 guys on it. Two days later, they reach the, the nest. They look around for two days. They find nothing. And Alfred Bielarts was never found. Dennis Martin, this is the case that probably bothers me the most out of any of them just because I've interviewed the dad. And I know the family was out and out lied to by the Park Service because I have all the reports. He was with his dad and his grandfather at a place called Spence Field, which doesn't have any public roads going to it. And it's, it's like a big open field where people camp at, surrounded by very thick woods. And the Martins, Mr. Martin, his dad, Dennis, and his brother, are just kind of running around the field, and the brothers are kind of playing. And you're going to see in these books that there's coincidences that can't be explained. And when I first read this, I read it four times before I could believe it. This is how strange this is. The Martins are up in this field by themselves. Nobody else is around. Another family walks up and sees the boys playing and goes, Hey, we have some boys too here. Do you mind if they play together? Mr. Martin knows, says, No, come on over. Sit down and join us. And this family says, Oh, our, I, my name is Claudia Martin. He goes, What? Oh, my name is Claudia Martin. And this is my husband, Ron. He goes, well, our, our name's Martins, too. How do you mean? How odd is that? Just, just to start the story with strangeness. Boys are playing together, running around. It's getting to be like 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And they're playing hide and, hide and seek. And Dennis goes behind one bush right on the fringe of the forest. Other boys go behind other bushes. And Mr. Martin tells me, he says, Dave, it's that sixth sense that parents have, that something's wrong. All the boys are starting to come, behind, come out from behind the bushes, and my son wasn't. I got up and walked 40 feet right over to that bush, and my son wasn't there. Fifteen feet away is the Appalachian Trail going south through the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and I took off on a dead run for two miles. And I didn't hear anything. I didn't see anything, and we never saw my son again. Appalachian Trail. Now, there's a whole lot of high strangeness that went on with this story. Within three hours when Dennis disappeared, it started to rain like it never rained in years at that park. And it rained straight for seven days. Another commonality in many of the disappearances I write about is Bad weather hits the area right after people disappear or right when they disappear. So Dennis disappears. Within two hours, there's 100 rangers at, at the location searching. Within 48 hours, there's green berets that show up. Now, I did a little research about this. 99.999% of the time, it's local National Guards people that come and search for missing people. Why? Because they're in the community, they're close, they're readily available. The Green Berets 
sign an agreement of secrecy with the government that they'll never state what their mission is. They'll never state what they're doing. Yet Green Berets fly in by helicopter within two days that Dennis disappears. And not only do the Green Berets show up, set up their own camp, their own communications network, they don't search with National Parks people. And at the time, the National Park Rangers weren't armed. The Green Beret were armed. And the search lasted three weeks. Canines found no scent. The NPS lied to the Martin family. And what did they lie about? And what did they keep them in the dark about? FBI agent shows up about four days into the search. And he says he's just monitoring the case. Another commonality of these disappearances. FBI never gets involved, yet they document everything. A family called the Key family, K-E-Y. The day Dennis disappeared, they come into the park and they go to the park service. They go, yeah, we're here with our family and we want to see some bears. So they send them to an area called Rowan's Creek, which is about two miles, three miles underneath Spence Field on a big loop called Cades Cove. And the family walks in. About an hour or so after Dennis disappears, the Key family is down below them by about 2,000 feet. And their boy stops mom and dad and says, hey, look, that looks like a bear up there. The dad says, that's, that's not a bear. It kind of looks like a man hiding behind the trees. And it kind of looks like he's so dark we can't even see him hardly, but he's darting in between all the trees. He family doesn't know that Dennis Martin disappeared. So at about this time, they hear a scream that they describe as the worst scream they've ever heard in their life. And it scared the family. They went back to their car and they drove home. The next day, across the front of the Knoxville Times, boy disappears in park, 3.30, blah, blah, blah. Mr. Key looks at this and goes, I wonder if we could have seen something that applied to that disappearance. So he calls the FBI and he says, hey, I'll meet you guys at the park and I'll show you where we were so you could kind of connect the grid lines. FBI agent says, no, we'll come to your house. First of all, highly weird. I'm the agent. I want to see exactly where they saw it and I want to understand it. So FBI agent goes out. Mr. Martin had an agreement with the Park Service that he would be told of any leads, anything, anywhere. A reporter picks up on this and asks the FBI and the Park Service employee investigator that went with the FBI to interview the keys and says, hey, could this be related? They say, oh, no, times don't match up, nothing matches, forget about it. That was total crap. What happened was is that the head tracker for the Park Service grabs the special agent that went and says, hey, what's the truth? And the guy tells him, tells him the timeline, tells him everything. His name is Dwight McCarter. I interviewed McCarter, and I said, hey, what, what is the truth? He says, the truth is, Dave, it all matched up. That was the best lead we had. And unknowns to me, and I don't know why, the Martin family was lied to. And uh, I went up to Mr. Martin, and I couldn't live with myself. I told him, hey, let's you and me walk that path directly from where Dennis disappeared down into Cades Cove. Let's see if we could do it in that time frame. They actually did it at a brisk walk. It wasn't even a run. Now, I interview Mr. Martin. And, again, like I said, the worst interview you can imagine. And when I end an interview with somebody, and I'm perplexed, and I'm looking for leads, I always end it like this. I said, hey, is there something that is missing in the news accounts? Or if I miss something in my investigation that I should know? And he looks me in the eye and he goes, no one's ever asked me that. He goes, you know the Key family? I said, yeah. He says, well, I think, Dave, you're on to something there. He says, you know what else they lied to me about? What's that? He says, well, the Keys, when they saw that thing darting between the trees... It had something on its shoulder. It was carrying something on its shoulder. And not only did the FBI not put it in the reports, but the Park Service never reported it to them. And in the Freedom of Information Act request, there isn't one mention of that key family observation. 
It was only mentioned in the Knoxville Times. And nobody would know about this observation until I just told you. Now, why the Park Service and the FBI covered that up and never wanted anybody to know, I have no idea. But I can tell you that Mr. Martin told me, he says, Dave, in 23 years, I have not talked to one reporter, and I never will again. And the reason I'm talking to you is you seem like an honest person, and you'll tell the truth. I go, you got that right. He goes, they've never told the truth. How would you like to lose a son and know that? This is actually a trail where uh, Trini Gibson, a 16-year-old female, disappeared in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. That's how thick the woods are right around it. In total, four people have disappeared in that park and never been found. The most recent one was in 2008. That was right on the perimeter of the park, Michael Heron. Now, a very, very peculiar story and very disturbing involved the disappearance of a boy named Bruce Haig, 16 years old, Boy Scout. He disappeared inside the park. He was at the back of a line of Boy Scouts, vanished. They searched for him for weeks, weeks. Finally, they found all of his gear in the middle of a river on a boulder. While it was snowing, and there was three or four inches of snow everywhere, the assumption was is that in the middle of this massive snowstorm, he waddles into the river, takes his backpack off, takes everything out of the backpack, and neatly puts it on this boulder inside, around with, in the middle of this river. They search, search, search. They decide to go upstream, and two miles upstream from where they found his backpack, they found Bruce Haig dead sitting against a tree, frozen to death. The disturbing thing about that story is that Bruce Haig's pants were pulled down to his knees and his boots and socks and gloves were taken off. Now, that story may sound very, very strange, but even stranger than that is that at Crater Lake National Park, 19 years earlier, a guy named Charles McCuller disappeared. And Charles was at the lake during the winter as well, disappeared. And this was a year where they had 25-foot snow drifts around the lake. And at Crater Lake, there's one road that goes right to the lake, and then that's it. And essentially, all the back country is closed. Charles just came there to take pictures. He didn't have any special gear. He didn't have anything except a little backpack. Vanished. Two years later, in the back country, uh, I think it was eight or nine miles from the point he was last seen at the lake, some people were hiking in the wilderness, and they found some bones that they thought were human, and they called the park service. And two rangers ride out to the scene. I interviewed one of those rangers. He said, Dave, 26 years as a law enforcement ranger, I've never seen anything like this. It disturbed me and my partner so much that we pulled out of there, put evidence tape around it, and called for an FBI evidence response team from Portland to come in and work the scene because we couldn't understand what happened. And we thought it was criminal. For a 26-year ranger who's found over 100 bodies in the backwoods to say that, you know something strange happened. What they found was a giant Douglas fir tree had fallen across this little creek. On the other side of this giant Douglas fir is they find a pair of pants, Levi's, the belt buckle undone, the pants and zipper undone, and the pants, he said, it looked like the, the boy had melted right into the pants. They were completely right down to his socks. And he says, but you see, the belt buckle was undone. The belt buckle on the pants was undone, and the zipper was down, Dave. Remember that. And he says, there was only one bone in the right leg, and it was a broken tibia bone. That's the shin bone. And he says, in the socks, there were little bones. He says, we never could find a femurs, the femurs, the hip bones, shoulder bones, the spine. We found a small part of the skull about 15 feet away. And everything else was in the size of very small pieces of bones scattered throughout the area. But he says, Dave, I've recovered a lot of people over the years. And one thing I always find, I always find boots. 
because boots can last up to 100 years in the wild because of what they're made of. We never found his boots, Dave. And he says that ended up being Charles McCuller. And in an area that was absolutely inaccessible by anybody in the winter. Even in snowshoes, he said, because of the piles of snow and the drifts were so large. Now, I almost stumbled out of my desk when I read the McCuller case and the Haig case and their similarities. And I don't know what to make of it. And as the ranger, the law enforcement ranger who's found 100 bodies in his 26 years said, that isn't normal. How he got there, why his pants were down to his socks like that, I have no idea. Now, in the books, you're going to talk me. You're going to see me talk about coincidence quite a bit. There may be coincidences, uh, but sometimes similarities just hit you in the face, and they say that's just too too common. Let's talk about Dennis Martin and Dennis Johnson. Both disappear in national parks. One boy's eight. One boy's six. One goes missing July 1st. One goes missing June 14th. They're both wearing red shirts. Their father's first name is William. Let's just stop there. Is that enough? I mean, who, who could put this stuff together? Bloodhounds in both cases couldn't track. Nothing of either boy was ever found. Storm hit the area after each boy disappeared. No tracks found. And you know, an unusual spin to this, and I can understand it, the father stayed for weeks and weeks afterwards, never giving up on their son. And for the parents in the room, I'm sure you guys understand that. I don't think I could leave knowing my boy was somewhere in the woods. Neither boy uh, was in a clearinghouse database up until just, just recently. And both disappeared, this is very odd, almost in their father's presence. Now, there's all kinds of similarities that I bring together in the books. I think it's odd. I think it's odd that we have these clusters of missing people in national parks. I think it's odd that the national parks don't keep information like that. I think it's odd that there isn't a national stampede up to the front of the National Park Service by the missing persons associations demanding accountability on it. You're not going to see a lot of press about my books. But I will tell you this, that we're not done with this topic yet, and we're continuing to plod forward, just like we found four more clusters. These aren't hard to find. We may be coming nearing an end, but it's a passionate topic, especially when you deal with kids in my book. And don't ever think, don't walk out of this room and ever believe that a child that disappears in the wild should never be found. If there's not a water source nearby, specifically, each one of the cases we have written about, we've excluded water as the cause. So, I've used up my two hours. I was trying to leave about 10 minutes here for the end for questions. Yes, sir. I'm wondering what is known about their search behavior specifically. Uh, what causes them to basically lay down and give up? What would happen if you were to take through an experiment with some people, walk them along a, a trail, and then have, for example, a, heli a, a lead attached to a, a thing that a helicopter could just lift it out of there. So this would be a case where the trail literally disappeared because you did an experiment to make the trail disappear. Uh, does Budhound in that, in that circumstance come there and circle around and lay down? Or uh, is there some other explanation? Is it the case we put, is, what is known about getting blood dogs to lay down? Are blood hounds different than other dogs? Could you use a different animal, a wolf or something, that might have different tracking behavior? Are there other animals that can track? Uh, but the question is, the notion is, that, well, there's something, there's more to be known there. And just a general comment, that's my question. The general comment is that 
Uh, basically, there's an old thing about uh, dividing and conquering. And uh, so the MUFON ET movement is interested in a certain class of phenomena. And uh, the Bigfoot uh, community is in a different one. And they apparently don't talk to each other, don't like. It's almost as if there's been some division created there, uh, perhaps by the government, whatever. And so uh, these, these are another second quick comment is that, uh, I mean, it could be ETs uh, abducting them. It could be uh, somebody experimenting on them with directed energy weapons or something. But uh, there's, a lot of, there's an awful lot of interesting questions here, so I'll let you answer the question about the, the, the uh, bloodhounds. So I, I should have clarified earlier. When I use the word bloodhound, I use that in a generic term. A few times in any of the reports, they name a species of dog that's tracking. So it could have been a German Shepherd, could have been any kind of dog. But just in, gen in generic terms, I use the word bloodhound in the books. Your, your point about being plucked out and helicoptered away is a great question. Now, spending 20 years in law enforcement, I worked on the SWAT team for three years, and we had canines and handlers assigned to our team, and we worked with them daily for three years. Those dogs live for the search. When they come out of the car, it's like, oh, my gosh, fun time at River City. They're all over it. And the same questions I asked the searchers here, and they said, we don't know. It's not in their behavior to do that. It's like all of the energy got zapped out of them. Great questions. No answers. Yes, sir. I just wanted to focus in on your last statement about the child in the dark, shadowy kind of thing going from tree to tree. If the person was able to see in the distance with the binoculars or whatever that there was a child on this person's shoulder or whatever back, how did they, if they could see that detail, how did they describe the person that was dressed or the thing dressed in black? No, they never said that they saw a child. They said something was, it was carrying something on its shoulder. Okay, so it's still unidefinable. Okay. Right. Yes, ma'am. Did you ever employ some psychics that are experienced in these searches to help you? Great question. And, you know, there was a few cases where I mentioned a psychic because in the National Park Service reports, they mentioned a psychic coming forward and helping. You would not believe how lambasted I was by some people for even mentioning a psychic in those reports. And the funny thing is, I could march in here probably 400 homicide detectives, and they've used psychics, and they've assisted in finding bodies. So go ahead and laugh all you want. Somehow or another, they work in certain circumstances. Yes, ma'am. I know that they found some of these children, and they couldn't remember them, or they were really little, and they really couldn't tell a very good story. Have you been able to interview some of them now that they're older, or have they been put under hypnosis to re try and remember what their experience was? So have some of the missing children who are older now been put under hypnosis to realize what happened to them? Great question, and something I would relish doing. We were advised early on by some, um, big, by some missing persons groups that we had to tread real lightly on these missing people. Meaning that some missing people, if we interviewed them and we gleaned their story, would view us as victimizing them a second time and then profiting from their loss. They told us to be very, very careful on the approach and how we worked with that people, with those people. So it was very, very limited that we actually did make an approach and we were really, really careful. In the perfect world, I would like to get every one of these people that lived through the experience at a conference like this. And a group go through hypnosis and understand the commonality of what happened. Because I think there's something there. Sir. Uh, you said that some of the missing children were later found. Um, but what was the longest duration of time in between when they were missing and when they were found? Probably three days, four days, five days, right in there. Bodies were found sometimes ten days. In the incident of McCuller, about 18 months. Yes, sir. 
Um, one of the times you were on Coast to Coast with George and Matt, I believe George brought up the theory that this could possibly, it sounds like alien abduction in some of the stories. Have you given that theory any more thought? So, during the last year, I probably got three or 4,000 emails. And unbelievably, I respond to everybody. And I think that's important. And I think that probably seven or eight I've received over the years were ten pages long or longer. And they honed in on a hypothesis of what happened. And I can honestly tell you that six out of the eight I would have never thought of a year ago. Yet, I couldn't exclude it 100% today. So, certain elements of this mimic other elements that we know about. So, yes and no. I mean, my eyes and my vision of what's going on has tripled in size. I hope I answered that. I don't mean to ignore it, but yes. Earlier you said that uh, after one of these uh, abductions or, or missing persons takes place, you said that uh, the weather changes uh, pretty significantly. Is, is, uh, is that 100% uh, of the time, 90% of the time, 75% of the time? And A large percentage of the time. Yeah. You said in one of the books that uh, some of the victims had uh, lacerations going from head to foot as if they were carried. You mentioned about the dogs that they lay down. That's also mentioned in the Bigfoot book, occasionally previously mentioned. Is there not an implication that some of these are perhaps related to Bigfoot, even though you perhaps don't want to say definitively for all of them? Talk about the scratches. A lot of them have horrible scratches. And, and they, they're, it's talked about by the parents and the searchers. And you see, I have a tough time understanding how a two- or three-year-old can move that fast through the woods and just... I can't imagine them just running and scratching themselves to shreds and they're close to shreds. I imagine them working slowly. This thought of them purposely motoring themselves that fast doesn't make sense. Now, I've been, now your thought about being carried is one thought. Another thought that people have told me is, what if it happened by going up? It would, it would have that same affect vertical. So it's that paradigm where, I mean, I, I'm caught in the same thoughts that you guys are, and every once in a while somebody brilliant writes me an email and catches me and says, ha ha, you didn't think of that. True. Yes, sir, Red Cap. Uh, there's, a, some, there's a story in the Western U.S. and Canada book uh, about uh, a, a guy who takes a girl out with him and comes back later and says that she's been kidnapped by a family of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Have there been any other uh, reports of any witness to something like that happening with any of these cases, even in the eastern United States? And do you believe that the, the, these missing kids have been eaten? You know, it's fascinating about that one story you talked about. The actual wording was a tribe of Bigfoot. Yes. And I thought, wow, that was years ago. That was Teresa Beyer. I don't know what to think. They arrested that guy for kidnapping and abduction, but they later released him, too. So... I know she's never been found. Sir. Uh, do you believe that the majority of these are abductions? And also, I'm going to ask you your favorite question. Is there anything that you left out of these publications um, that maybe you've discovered since the release of these books that you can share that would shed some light on any of these cases? Is there anything I purposely left out of the books? No. And what was the other part? Are these abductions, in your opinion? I think in many of the cases, you would be foolish not to look at that angle. Sir? Have you done any research into the missing people on the highway of tears? We've looked at it. And uh, we actually know some people in the RCMP. What that is, is that's a highway that runs through parts of British Columbia, and there's just been an inordinate amount of uh, First Nations people, women specifically, that have disappeared. And they actually uh, put a task force together about two years ago to work those cases. And it's, un it's unfortunate it should have been done ten years earlier. But there's a, there's a lot of whodunits. There's a lot of questions about what's happened there. 
And I just heard recently on the QT that they actually have a suspect on a majority of those. I don't know if they'll have enough to put the case together, but I, I don't think all of them fit the criteria, but it's, it's an interesting set of disappearances. Same as, uh, I don't know if you guys could go home and Google this, there's been a series of feet that have been found in shoes that have washed up on beaches in North America, predominantly on the western U.S. Actually, one washed up on Eureka. And uh, where they came from, it's another big whodunit. Back row, bald man. Yes, sir. Well, I'm not quite bald, but anyhow. <laughs> I just saw the below. Because <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Uh, do, do dogs have, have trouble following a live Bigfoot trail, or do they lay down and give up? I have no idea. Be interested in finding that out. Got to find a Bigfoot to track him first. Well, when one gets kidnapped by a tribe, you know, that would be a time to launch some dogs. Find out if they give up, they walk them on and then give up. Yes, Steve? Hey, Dave, there was a uh, disappearance of a young boy in Oregon a couple of years ago. I don't remember his name, but it got a little bit of press. Did, did any of the, the, the telltales of that case match what you've been studying? Not sure. Not sure which case you're talking about. I wish I could remember his name. Um, I can't. It was a couple of years ago. Back row, yes. Uh, you said earlier that you saw a Bigfoot. Did I understand you correctly? Yes, sir. Could you elaborate on that? So most people would think that uh, Patterson-Gimlin and Bigfoot's walking through a, a riverbed and you get a good look at it for like 45 seconds. That is essentially never been heard of since and hasn't been heard of again. And what I tell people is I think, you think about this. What is the ratio in the woods today of people with the device that re could record what Patterson and Gimlin saw? What's the ratio in the woods today versus 1967? And these yohos catch him for almost a minute, and there's been nothing like that since. Why? I don't know. Sir. You know, from your law enforcement background, you can size up people's demeanor, presentation, and what they tell you. As far as the National Park Service, the officers, are they telling you a funny story where they want you to hear? Or are they taking you back on the low low and telling you the what they just want to tell you? So I, I didn't get to talk to you face to face, so I really couldn't size them up too well, other than. Other than I was a little surprised he wasn't nicer to me, knowing who I was, and I, I wasn't being belligerent or, or unfriendly to him, and for him to take that stance was unusual. So I really don't know how to, how to take it. Yes? Is there, forgive me for listening to you very carefully, I just want to make sure you weren't parsing words. Is there anything that you unintentionally left out of the book? No. Talk about your sight. About my sight? Your sighting. My sighting. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, and then there was this. <laughs> so uh, I don't usually talk about it, but I don't mind. So it wasn't that Patterson-Gimlin kind of sighting. And uh, Scott Carpenter prepped me for what we were walking into and, and what we would be looking at. And I think that the more people that got this training, probably there would be many more sightings. So when you're in the woods and you're walking into a national park, start being observant the first time you hit that trailhead because we believe that they're watching us a lot more than we ever believe. And they'll probably be laying down in bushes. And if you're not real cognizant, they're probably there. We walked in and we got into an area where Scott had had maybe 12 or 14 DNA samples. And there's a giant, giant row of bushes 15 feet in front of us. Giant, about eight, ten feet high, thick, thick, thick. And when you stand back and you look at it, you're just seeing all that. Scott goes, okay, Dave, walk up there, put your hands like you're looking through binoculars, and take that big space and focus it down so you're looking at, say, a six-foot diameter look. Slowly work your way from right to left and tell me if you see anything. And I'm going to work my way left to right. Holy cow. I went to like four feet. 
I said, Scott, I'm not going to blink. I'm not going to move. But about eight feet over from the right end fringe and about three feet off the ground, there's a face as, as well as me staring at me right now. And we had the staring contest until my eyes went dry. And I would move my head to the left. It would move its head to the left. I'd move my head to the right. It'd move his. And then I'd go like this. And it would go like that. A little later than me, not at the same moment. And like I said, right around the eyes, it had this whiteness that almost looked like a raccoon, but a totally human face, hair around it. Only thing I saw was this right here. Guaranteed it was big for Yes, sir. You turn it down at that point? <laughs> Good point. No, I wasn't. Oh, um, One of the rare times. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't go into a forest now that I've heard this without one. <laughs> no, we don't either. <laughs> uh, how, uh, talking to those to the Indians that you befriended and also your uh, person that you brought with you that was friends with your language, how far back in Indian lore, Indian history, does, do, uh, do these go back with them? I mean, are we talking a uh, thousand years, uh, 500 years, or, or recent, or a hundred years? Well, Tilly River was 1,500 to 2,000 years. And uh, the elders I talked to, they talked back 150 years. They talked about a story where they were walking down a trail along the Klamath River, and uh, they were walking to meet friends on a Sunday, and two Bigfoot and a little tiny, like a husband and a wife and a little tiny one, were walking the other way, and they said, this has been handed down through, from my grandmother to me, and they'll never forget it, that draped over their shoulders, they had kelp. Now, go back and Google kelp and, and the type of things that are in it. There's like medicinal qualities. There's all kinds of healthy things in kelp, including salt byproducts. And I thought, nobody could ever make that up. That's like way too good. So you hear those stories going back years and years. And then you read about uh, Lucy Thompson and her stories going back to the late 1800s. Sir. Yes. Uh, the reason why no one has found a Bigfoot body or recent evidence of one having died is they do not live in our space-time. They are prehistoric like the Neanderthal man. When someone sees a big foot, they're going through a portal like a time warp. So they're not actually in our time anymore. They're in their time. So uh, the only Bigfoot bodies that anyone has claimed to have found have been hoaxes. And uh, the same thing with the people that disappear. They're going through interdimensional portals. They may, it may be one way, or maybe a round trip, but they can come back in a different space time. Okay, thanks. Oh, uh, just like when Steve Fawcett disappeared, the balloonist, yeah. they couldn't find him anywhere. I had no idea what happened to his plane. And then I think it was after the winter season was over, they claimed they found some bones. But I think that was just a, a cover story. And they never found Steve Fawcett either. Okay. Sir, in the back. Yeah, not, not too long ago, someone said, uh, I guess there's a, a, a makeup artist, costume guy, claimed that he uh, made the, the Bigfoot costume for the Peterson. Absolutely baloney. Absolute fabrication. John Green, who's, who's one of the most respected Bigfoot researchers in the world, Right after the Patterson-Gimlin film, he took the footage to Disney Studios, who at the time built the best costumes in the world, best in the world. And he has it on written documentation from Disney that there's no way they could have done it. That was in like 68 that he got that letter from them. So you hear that every once in a while. Don't believe all that stuff. I understand why people do, but don't believe it. Yes, ma'am. Sample uh, that we use for the DNA analysis that you referenced. 
like, where did they get collected from? Well, over 30, over 38, I think, came from our organization. So, they get them in the some got from some came from Arizona, some from Hoopa, some from Great Smoky Mountain National Park. But, I mean, they would just find them in no, 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 no. <laughs> so one of them is uh, there's a story in Tribal Bigfoot, Raven Ulibari. She sees a Bigfoot come into her yard. He reaches over this tin shed where she keeps her garbage. He picks up two bags of garbage. She already has the police responding. She sees him walk into the woods. The police drive into the yard over the over the metal tin shed. Always Bigfoot will have hair growing in long mangles from their forearms for some reason. And a bunch was ripped off on this metal shed as he was pulling the bags over. And we got a big sample from that. That was tested. It was those kind of things. See it. Get it. Test it. Yes, sir. Is it the Olympic project that you work with? Uh, they apparently said they've got footage, video, uh, that's very definitive. I think Mel McKetchen mentioned it, or perhaps you did on a radio show many moons ago. To go with DNA. Is any release on that, perhaps, in the future? So the Olympic project doesn't have the footage. Adrian Erickson has the footage. And Adrian is uh, a man from Canada. He bought some property in Arkansas, put a couple of researchers on it for a few years. The footage is outstanding. Uh, it's up to Adrian. I, I thought it, I thought it would have been by now. There's there's been some little bits and pieces that have been, but just enough to whet your appetite. But he's got some good stuff. What do you think about Todd standing in his footage? I don't know what to think. Uh, I mean, if it's real, it's outstanding. If it's a hoax, he's done a good job. I don't know what to think. I don't know. Never, Never did. Yes, sir. Bruce Haig's death. Bruce Haig. Bruce Haig. They found, they found the body. Exposure. Exposure. And you'll notice that about 95% of the time, when doctors really don't know why you died, you died of exposure. Hmm. Sir. Missing 411 type people. Do you get people with full facial hair disappearing? Great question. Do, in Missing 411, do people with full facial hair disappear? You know, honestly, I don't remember one. I may be wrong, but it just doesn't hit me. It's a good question. It doesn't hit me. Right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. inside my brain. I wish I knew the significance behind them. But when they strike me as odd, with my background, they've got to strike you guys as being odd. And I point them out to maybe show the obvious or exemplify the obvious. It's something here more unusual than what we think is going on. And for... I mean, there's... I think there's... Out of the two or 3,000 emails I've had just on those books, I've had maybe one or two negative comments. The most common comment is, Dave, you've really hit on something here. There, there's, there's something here we don't understand, and there's, the Park Service isn't telling us the truth. And I'm not saying it to sell books. I'm saying that, hey, we have four and five season, season law enforcement guys working these cases all the time, and we're dumbfounded by what we find now. Sir, how much uh, money revenue is generated by uh, visitors to national parks, and how important that is? Hundreds of millions. There's a guesstimate that 750 million a year is generated by Great Smoky Mountain National Park to the local economy. Sir, in the back. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is that why they're withholding this information from the public? If there are these mysterious uh, abductions going on in these parks? Well, let's let's think about that for a second. If the abduction scenario 
as truly as bothersome as it appears, then it's something that the Park Service obviously can't control. Does that make sense? If the government can't control something, what do they do? Exactly. Don't want to address it. Don't want to talk about it. Won't release it. We've heard about this before. And I'm not sure yet, and I'm not saying that yet, but it does seem to be not right. Sir, in the back. Have any of the family members who were associated with their children being abducted experienced any missing time while on those excursions? Good question. Don't know the answer to it. Yes. I was wondering more about like what you said, the powers that Bigfoot had or those that Hoopa described them having, like the telepathic or the hypnosis powers. Like, Can you go more into that? You know, I, it wasn't the Hoopa people specifically saying that. It was the Claylam Indians in that 1924 article. But I've heard this many times over from other, other tribes from, in other parts of the U.S., their ability to mimic, mimic not only people and relatives, but animals in the woods. Um, I've had some Native Americans say, you know, one minute you're looking right at them, and the next minute you look at them and they're gone. And they couldn't have moved that quick to get out of there. There's, there's, there's a whole series of these things that are, are made as claims, but it's really...